kicked this off who kicked this off a few years ago. So this is our third year now. And the idea is everybody's excited about home dialysis. Um, and we all want to um, train, especially our fellows uh, to feel comfortable in home dialysis. And we thought, hey, a great way to do this is if we have a home dialysis specific journal club, but let's involve other institutions so we can kind of pool our resources and our interests and our enthusiasm. Um, and uh, this is our West Coast one. Um, we also have East Coast and Central time zones running as well. And um, if you want that information, um, I'll forward it to you. It's also available on the website as well. Um, sometimes we cover the same articles. Oftentimes we don't, because usually we let it be a uh, fellow fellow led for the uh, journal club articles that they pick. Um, we have, you know, just uh, to respect the time of everybody who um, joined on time, I'll go ahead and get started. So this journal club is going to be uh, led by uh, Dr. Manny Rivera. He is a nephrology fellow at University of Washington. So thank you so much for starting us off. And the article he's going to be discussing is called Quantifying the Risk of Insertion Related peritoneal dialysis catheter complications following laparoscopic placement, results from the North American PD catheter registry. So um, I was really excited about this article um, because uh, Dr. Matt Oliver, who's on with us today, he changed his uh, schedule around to be able to make it. Uh, he's the uh, first author. He um, and Rob Quinn uh, really, um, oh, I think it was like 10 years ago now, um, everybody in North America, um, the North American chapter, we all were excited and wanted to work together to get more research done. And the idea was how should we how should we do this? And so the two of them kind of spearheaded this idea of organizing um, a bunch of different centers to put information on catheters um, and complications and insertion techniques and so on into a large registry. So we could start by just doing some um, what we what I thought was going to be just like basic, you know, like, let's just start with just some descriptive uh, epidemiology. And so studying catheters is a lot more complicated methods wise than, um, than I realized. Um, and so I thought it'd be a great opportunity to talk about this paper to talk about catheters and complications. Um, and, you know, just generally research uh, MPD in the in North America. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to you, Dr. Rivera. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to say I have a pretty thick skin. So Manuel, don't feel bad about criticizing I can take it. No, it's <laughs> okay. Thank you, though. Um, so thank you for the introduction. So before we start, uh, it, this was published in uh, 2020 uh, as well, um, to begin with. Uh, so there's been a movement uh, recently to increase PD and home dialysis, uh, mainly due to uh, like patient's quality of life and cost. And I thought it would be ideal to maintain up-to-date recent studies and uh, recommendations. So let's get started. Uh, our objectives will tell a bit about background, study methods, uh, results, conclusions, study limitations, and uh, implications for clinical practice, and then some further research questions. In terms of background, as we're talking about um, the North American chapter for International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis um, was um, established in 2015, um, as well, and the goal for it was to improve practice and patient outcomes after PD catheter insertion. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the 2023 ISPD recommendations on catheter-related infections. Um, and when we talk about that, it relates to infections that occur within 30 days of insertion. Um, pretty much the recommendations at, um, you know, at this moment will be to do some immediate prophylactic antibiotic before insertion, some uh, nasal antibiotic prophylaxis for uh, patients who are SRS carriers to maintain the dressing intact for seven days after repeating insertion and monitor infections on a yearly basis. And then they talk about this exit site uh, infection to be no more than um, 0.4 episodes per year at risk. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so in this study, um, they talk about insertion-related complications 
uh, which lead to significant adverse events. Um, I just want to clarify that. Um, risk of complications among patients undergoing uh, laparoscopic PD catheter insertion, um, because they thought it was like the most the most common one they saw. Um, so they pretty much um, studied that group. Um, and at this moment, there's no recommendation from ISPD in terms of what method to use. The only thing they mention is that when there's a major surgery um, or peritonitis in the past um, to do for a laparoscopic open insertion. Let me get this uh, laser point. In terms of study methods um, for this study, it was based on a prospective multi-center um, study uh, gathering 14 uh, centers in Canada and the uh, US. Um, it chose 500 patients between uh, the 2015 in November all the way to July uh, 2018. Uh, in terms of patient characteristics, uh, it was you need to be like 18 year old or older to do a laparoscopic PD, which hasn't shown to be, you know, different from other methods. Um, they needed to have a three, a minimum of three months follow up, and up to uh, a year, like 12 month of follow up, and they will be terminated from the study if any of these happen, either renal recovery transplant, you know, they go into HD, withdrawal, loss of follow-up, or, you know, or that. Um, in it, they average about like 27 uh, patients uh, per site. Um, so I actually want to ask uh, Matthew, because I saw on the patient and the, on the paper that 54 patients that underwent uh, laparoscopic PD were excluded due to less than three months potential follow-up. I just want to like your comments in that, um, you know, what was that about? It was more about the expectancy or if there's, if there was something else up there. It means that they would have been in, their catheter was inserted within three months of the 7-24-2018. So they, they didn't have the, a long enough period to follow them. Um, if people terminated within three months, um, for another reason, say they, you know, failed PD or whatnot, then they were included. So um, it gets a little confusing. People ask us about that all the time. But if they terminated with a complication before three months, but they had three months of potential follow-up, then they were still included. These would be people who just got registered. Okay. So, and then again, there were uh, excluded were all these patients. Uh, some of them underwent percutaneous PD and others underwent just open, open surgical insertion. So what they meant with a uh, complication uh, will be uh, the following. They talk about flow restriction, exit site leak, uh, being one of the most common uh, complications after PD catheter insertion, uh, abdominal pain, talk about infection, bleeding within 30 days after insertion, and then urinary retention from anesthesia, and they pretty much excluded all uh, complications that can be reversible, talking about um, um, pleural or groin leaks and then hernias um, as well. And there were actually, the they did a medical record review um, every 30 days um, for the first three months. And then they did it every 90 days uh, or like three months um, until one year. And then in terms of adverse events, um, it means that PD was never started or it was terminated, delayed, interruptions. They went to the ED, were admitted, others, or some invasive procedure. That meaning uh, either radiological manipulation or just laparoscopic uh, repositioning replacement and then only included uh, as outcome those patients who, um, who, who you know, never started PD, and then excluded all of them that could be treated the float restriction, um, you know, underwent the renal recovery, death, transplant, or a complication not related to insertion. 
And this is pretty much to um, lay out the terms that what, what they mean like later on the graphs. Um, by PD never started, uh, they meant that you know, either HD was started or the PD cat was removed. PD delay means that PD training or the PD star was put on hold and interruption termination, it was PD on hold or HD is started. Um, and then as primary outcome, uh, it, they mentioned that it was a risk of any insertion related complication within, within six months after PD catheter insertion. And then the secondary outcome was the risk of complications before and after starting PD. And then just to keep in mind, this was funded by the uh, North American chapter and then the intern renal network, Baxter Healthcare and Medtronic. <laughs> And then keep in mind that um, all the adverse um, events were considered before actually starting um, uh, complications before actually starting PD. So in terms of results, um, here in table one, we have patients uh, characteristics. And in table two, operators um, characteristics. Um, they talk about PD was actually started about 84% of the 500 uh, patients um, with about time of uh, starting PD about 30 days. Um, and about 3% of them never started and about 1% of them uh, did not start due to, due to a complication. Um, there were some other reasons for not starting PD um, that we're talking about embedded catheters uh, or death or just transferring out of the program or transplant. And pretty much in here, what I can notice, um, there was a bit more of a male, uh, dominantly 59% um, characteristics. Um, from, from the rest, I couldn't pick up that much um, significance there or like difference that I could pick up. Um, in terms of the operator, um, mostly that most of them go for the coil tip. We'll talk about that later. Um, but besides that, um, you know, nothing much else relevant that I was able to, to pick up in that sense or different. Um, so in terms of the six month cumulative effect for insertion-related complications leading to an adverse event. Um, so the measure was actually 24%, uh, which for me is actually pretty high. Um, they mentioned flow of restriction was the biggest one, uh, followed by exit site leak at 5.7 and then abdominal, abdominal pain. Uh, they included some others, um, which are actually less than uh, 3%, including like urinary retention, bleeding or wound, dehiscence. And most of them um, happen within the three months of insertion. Uh, but actually the risks keep accumulating um, to six months. And then as, as at first events, uh, PD that was actually never started or terminated was 6.4%. And those four, Invasive procedure was actually 8.8%. Um, and again, the most common was in this case was flow flow restriction for, for both. And almost like all of the, like 50% of them of complications happened before starting PD. And now uh, we'll go into the figures. A uh, figure one here, um, in terms of the um, axis, I think you have cumulative cumulative risk um, here in the y-axis. And then on the x, um, it's more about comparing the three months versus six month um, complications in that sense. And here you can see mostly there's more difference in flow restriction and pain uh, when comparing the three months and uh, in six months. Um, 
and then total is different about um, 20 and 24. I, I put that term in, in percentage. Um, so that three months difference actually adds, um, you know, 20% more risk or roughly about 3% uh, per month. And then um, the second one, the figure two here, it's more about adverse events that happen. Again, comparing the three months versus six months. Uh, mostly talki talking about um, going to the ED or being admitted and then uh, procedures that happen. Here on figure three, so I'll actually go, it's actually um, like, you know, they're trying to go for the causes of insertion related complication, um, but I'll go from the top to bottom, uh, which one had the, the most, in terms of like other things that happen um, for ED or hospitalization, um, that, that was the, the cause for, Patients who never started or terminated PD, mostly, um, or for infection, was PD that was never started or terminated. Um, for the third one with Spain, it's actually this one here. Um, again, most common visits for ED and or hospitalization. For leaks, it was PD being delayed or interrupted. And then flow is the big one that was actually for uh, procedures. Um, some other things to keep in mind, um, they mentioned about 11% um, of, of patients uh, started PD uh, within two weeks. Um, and there was exit site leak in 9.2% uh, of them in three months, and then 11.2% in six months. Um, and then there was a 50% risk reduction when starting PD after two weeks. Um, I think for me, those were the most important. In terms of community effect of PD start, less than six months was 14.4%, uh, uh, which is lower than the 24% uh, cumulative risk um, at six months. Um, pretty much what we're trying to get uh, from all of this is like as time pass, um, uh, especially more than two weeks, uh, and uh, as it gets closer to six months before they start PD, there's a higher chance that they might have, they get some type of complication the longer we wait. Which leads us to our conclusion uh, that insertion related complication leads to an adverse event roughly about one per every four patients uh, within six months. And 50% complications happen before starting PD. And patients are likely to benefit from starting uh, PD more than two weeks, uh, but probably before three months. And then there were some about 3% um, patients on PD were terminated due to infection related. Some of the study limitations I, um, you know, that were explained about was that there was no direct measure about their experience. Um, those mentioned in the paper, which um, they were talking about how will this can affect their like sleep or how they felt. Um, so I think that's something they wanted to look about or may consider uh, next time. Um, in terms of method of extraction, uh, could potentially underestimate complications. So we're talking about, uh, they're saying that uh, in terms of flow restrictions or alarms can disturb their sleep, the use of laxative um, or extra clinical visits, more imaging, uh, the flushes and thrombolytics. Uh, so all those kind of uh, uh, things to take in consideration uh, probably next time. Um, and then the PD insertion varies by program specific practice, which I think 
and it's it's very difficult um, um, to control uh, in that sense because there's so many things to take in mind, especially when I'm placing a catheter um, in a patient, and then the experience from each um, like uh, surgeon or whoever is putting the catheter in. So uh, those were some of the study limitations. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about implications for clinical practice. Um, you know, what's the ideal method of insertion as we were talking about? Uh, again, PD initiation timing. Um, um, it should be better than more than two weeks. And three months, it's better than um, uh, six months um, as, as, as well. Um, we it says they favor uh, radiological manipulation uh, due to higher PD continuity. Usually, what they do is they put a um, uh, like fluoroscopy, and then they're able to like manipulate the catheter um, until it pretty much works uh, at that point. And it seems that patients who were able to do that were able to continue PD uh, rather than actually going uh, laparoscopy. And then some of the, again, some of the ISPD 2023 recommendations uh, mention about prophylactic antibiotics before insertion, which we tend to do that. Um, some nasal um, antibiotic prophylaxis for patients who carry uh, SRs and then dressing to remain intact for the first seven days. Um, and then they talk about a goal of less than seven, uh, 5% for PD catheter insertion, uh, which I think is actually a good goal and was, we should be monitoring that um, as well. And then monitor infections on a yearly basis. And then in terms of the exit side infection, um, no more than 0.4 episodes per year at risk. So they're talking about uh, since they start PD, so all the, that's the, the the bottom number, the denominator will be since they start PD and are undergoing. Um, so that number of years um, per patient, and then the, the numerator, the top number will be just the episodes uh, of exit side infection. And the issue with this one as well, it's like sometimes it's not really minor, um, even with the majority of, of, of PD uh, places, uh, I try to reach out uh, here in NKC and make sure that even the PD catheter insertion complications were not were not minor uh, in that sense. So I think probably starting with that will be will be a good idea. In terms of additional recommendations that they they mention, um, so they they said the optimal exit site uh, when considering for the PD should be taken in a seating position. Uh, they mentioned the double cough PD shown to decrease risk for SR spirituritis um, as well. So I found that quite interesting. And then showing here in the paper is actually not, not that much uh, commonly used. The exit side infection preventing training or retraining um, as well. It says that training, um, the exit site infection prevention um, showed about 10 times reduction exit site um, in infection in a study in UK. And also the retraining party in Korea, it showed decreased rates um, as well with the retraining. And, and I don't think this is, you know, something that's emphasized either. Uh, they actually mentioned about using uh, US Doppler or like ultrasound Doppler um, to assess a high vascularity um, when, you know, can be a more of a sign for concern for infection. And then they mentioned if there's a catheter infection with a purulent discharge plus peritonitis to remove the cath, place HD to do it temporarily, and then attempt reinsertion roughly in about two weeks. For future research um, and questions, they mentioned, well, you know, it's what's mentioned, the best tra training method, talking about the place, person, approach, 
the nurse patient ratio, right? Most of the places that right now use a one to one, um, but you know there was a a good study as well saying that you know so far has been um has decreased the risk at least of peritonitis only, but they did not measure the uh, exit site uh, infection uh, either. Uh, monitor PD catheter injection infection rate, as I mentioned before, um, I think will be a good start um, in terms of you know what we can do different and then to maintain that compliance with uh, PD. The indication frequency, duration, and content of exit site prevention retraining. Um, so it's a bit difficult was that I was thinking about this. Um, I was say, you know, usually patients at risk uh, will be ideal or pretty much, and you know, the, the best thing will be prevention here. Um, so patients who already have an infection will, you know, they will be uh, referred to this program, but uh, also patients who um, are at risk, I will say, either assessment by the nurse a family who's concerned, the patient itself, um, or, you know, there's notice that the patient is actually non-compliant with a topical antibiotic. Um, I think, you know, at least those could be some of the um, indications to at least do a retraining uh, to try to prevent these infections um, as well. Uh, there's no study so far about the length of antibiotics for exit side infection. So I think this that'll be a good a good study. Um, there's been studies or there's an ongoing study, um, which is a, a multi-center and double blind um, randomized clinical trial. It's called Cosmo PD, um, but they're pretty much trying to use different um, top topical. Um, either antibiotics or cleaning methods um, to try to prevent PD-related infections that's still, still ongoing. Um, but the hope is for PD and home HD patient uh, numbers you know, to increase in the upcoming years and for us to be up to date on the latest guidelines and the best way to treat the patients. I'll take further questions. Thank you so much for that uh, presentation. So feel free to, um, you can either type your questions um, into the chat, you can raise your hand, um, or you can also just unmute yourself as well. And um, actually, uh, Dr. Uh, Matthew, do you wanna go ahead first? I saw your hand go up right away. Yeah, no, it's a very nice presentation. I think a really important topic. So um, I just had a couple of questions that maybe maybe Dr. Oliver can, uh, can also uh, chime in. So, um, what are do we do we have any sense of what the surgical side, what their do they do they measure quality metrics in regards to their insertion rates and you know what are their guidelines around? I, I have a couple of questions, but th that one I was really kind of curious about. Uh, I'm not a. I mean, I'm not aware of any measurements uh, that we've heard of. Maybe in the U.S. there's some, there is some quality stuff they're required to do, but some of the surgeons we've reached out to, and we've reached, we have over a hundred operators now in the registry. They have indicated they would be interested in receiving their results. Okay. Um, hmm. um, just a general statement. It seems like there's kind of like expert operators who are very interested in this, like right. Crabtree and Todd Penner and local mm -hmm. pockets, and then. There's other surgeons, I think, who really just see this as like a really basic procedure right. compared to their other procedures. Um, and so I think there is a lot of variation in that regard. Yeah, I mean, that's been my experience. I've I've experienced the latter part more than the former. Um, and even in terms of planning, like you said, you know, planning the exit side in the seated position, my sense is that most patients are just brought to the OR and they figure out what to do. Um, just because they're always doing laparoscopics. Um, my second question um, was, were there any patient predictive factors or is this all technical, these complications? That's a great question. We haven't modeled that yet. 
Um, so one of the big things that we had to struggle through with the, this registry is coming up with an objective measure of complications, which is kind of why we framed it the way it is. Um, we first tried to, you know, the first concept of what is what the cause is, as, as was outlined, right? Flow, pain, et cetera. And then what the consequence is. If you read papers, um, oftentimes they kind of mix them together and they're kind of like muddled in their definitions. And the reason we had to link it to um, adverse events is because we could tell early on there was variation occurring in the measurement because some programs were writing every single complication down, like every flow restriction of, of, of minor to major and others weren't. So we were losing our benchmarking. So we made the decision that we would we would link it to a major event, um, which hopefully could be audited. And so we also have an auditing component to the registry where we've gone into the sites and and, and had the uh, um, audited their EMR independently to make sure that we're capturing the events. And um, so that's part of the reason why we restricted it to like the things that we did, you know, ED hospitalization procedures, stopping PD, these things should be fairly objective. Thank In you. terms of patient characteristics, we haven't done the model. We haven't done the model yet on that. I have to say, um, especially uh, for the fellows, um, hopefully now there are less of these myths that are going around in terms of who's not an appropriate uh, PD patient. But um, I thought it was worth mentioning, if you look at the average BMI of these patients is 28.8, um, which I guess for the United States is not that high, um, but that is still considered uh, overweight. And then also, if you look in terms of diabetes, that uh, more than half of the patients uh, in the studies did have diabetes. So I think um, in the past, I've heard people say before, oh, well, if you're obese, then you shouldn't do PD. Or if you have diabetes, you shouldn't do PD because you've got uh, dextrose in the fluid. Um, but that's not the case. I mean, uh, almost all of my patients on PD have diabetes because almost all of my CKD patients are uh, have diabetes. Um, and the same thing in terms of uh, the BMI of these patients. Um, and then there's a question in the chat. Do you have any information on catheters placed for delayed externalization? So I think they're talking about embedded catheters. Yeah, we had quite a few embedded catheters. One of our sites, uh, Ottawa, does exclusively embedded catheters. And there's a, there was St. Mike's that did embedded catheters. Really interesting um, because we were we were we were uh, we were um, supposed to follow people for twelve months from insertion, and we have li literally been following some of these embedded catheters for like four years. So it's funny to see um, how long some of them are in place for. Um, so we are going planning to do a future paper on embedded versus non embedded because there's kind of pros and cons to embedded, right? embedded um, creates kind of a lead time bias. So like you're putting the catheter in much earlier than when they need to start PD. So they could either get complications, they, they basically could have a competing event such as death or something while they wait for that PD or they don't progress or something. So versus the advantage of getting it in early. So it's gonna be interesting to really see how that plays out. The other point I wanted to make just before I forget is that like, I don't think people should be scared by that 24% number. Um, first of all, it was laparoscopic only. And some of these programs do both percutaneous and laparoscopic. So the tougher cases are going to laparoscopic. Our newer papers suggest that the, the complication rate is not as high. But one of the things that I learned from this is like, you know, complications are par for the course. If you're a fellow, <laughs> if you're a fellow, you're going to see catheter complications. It doesn't mean that something is wrong. You've done something wrong. Your insertion technique is wrong. I just think it's it's sometimes people are going to have a rocky start and they're going to have complications. And that's something I think is an important takeaway uh, from this. Dr. Goldberg? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Jenny. A, a couple things, and I, it, it really wasn't mentioned, but but what Matt has done here is this is a real world experience. Uh, the overwhelming majority of studies about catheters are single center experiences with maybe two or three surgeons. And 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 Matt, uh, you had what uh, you know twenty some centers, and each center had multiple surgeons. This is real world data, which supports the point you made about the twenty four percent complication rate. That's item one, and I think. I think you just got muted halfway through, Dr. Goldberg. 
did, huh? That was probably you muting me. Yeah, that's it. It wasn't you, was it, Jenny? No, do you want to go ahead and finish? Okay. Uh, anyway, so this, th I want to emphasize this was a real world experience of multiple centers with multiple surgeons at every center. Also, the uh, presenter uh, uh, asked questions about the uh, patient's perception of things. That study is ongoing. Uh, Rachel Fassell, and you may be part of it, Jenny, is working on that. She has a, a questionnaire uh, on patient's perception of their experience with the catheter. Third item was on the reporting of outcomes by the surgeons. Uh, Matt, I think the best chance of that is gonna come out of Canada. I, I see very little hope for that in the US unless it's somehow mandated. We're having enough trouble just getting uh, 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 recording of what happens in PD in some uniform manner, let alone uh, with the surgeons. So I'm kind of pessimistic about that. And then my last point has to do with the buried catheters. Uh, it's it's anecdotal, uh, but the, there are people who swear by them that uh, Matt's patient with four years with that catheter in and everything uh, uh, works when the catheter is uh, externalized uh, versus uh, uh, problems with uh, adhesion, for example. And I would argue that one of the computing, uh, or pardon me, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the competing uh, risk is not only just death, but but uh, a competing risk is no hernias uh, because the catheter has had time to heal. And then another competing risk is adhesion. So the actual complications have competing risk. Uh, but all in all, I, I just, I want to emphasize uh, that, that Matt and Rob Quinn have started the North American Research Consortium in PD, and all the programs that may be listening are, are welcome to join it. Uh, I mean, there's some obligations if you do, but we're, we're looking for uh, more centers uh, in, in the program. Thanks so much, Dr. Goldberg. So I'm just going to go, um, but in terms of like uh, the order that the comments were posted, there's a question of whether the pain was related to the procedure or surgical related, or was it during a uh, pain during PD treatment? It, it was all types of pain. We we didn't restrict it to like in drain pain or pain related to the PD procedure itself. We we tried to capture as much as we could. Um, but this was pain that led to something to do with the PD, right? So like they stopped the PD, they went to ER, they had a procedure. Um, we, we know we may have to arbitrate this a bit in the future, but it was kind of pain in general. But in the clinician's mind, it was related to PD because they did a PD intervention as a result. And there's a reminder that heart failure is also not a contraindication to PD. Um, absolutely. Um, and uh, there's a comment that they'd like to use it more often in heart failure, especially in the elderly. I think one of the issues I've had is if I have a patient who has really awful heart failure, um, I think many of the one of the um, things I've come across is in terms of um, whether the surgeons feel comfortable during this uh, the surgery in terms of anesthesia clearance because of the heart failure issues. But I don't know if anybody else has come across that. This is obviously for those who have very advanced heart failure. And there's also a question about, um, do we have any data on nephrology inserted catheter? And Dr. Oliver noted that actually we do have a good number of nephrology inserted catheters now. I'm assuming those are not laparoscopic unless they're dual chain in surgery as well. Those are probably the percutaneous placed ones. Percutaneous and uh, we have some of the, I think best percutaneous operators um, like Arsh Jane, we have over 150 of his percutaneous catheter. So, um, and he does pretty high risk patients with scars and things. So we should have some really nice benchmarks for nephrology based insertion. Uh, this paper, we restricted laparoscopic because the pro one of the primary questions for the grant, which has a sample size of 2300, which we have now acquired, uh, is to look at the method of insertion. So we didn't want to put percutaneous in this paper because we knew the reviewers would start wanting us to compare percutaneous to laparoscopic, and we'll be doing that a little bit later. It's it's very challenging, though, to, to match the patients perfectly. Like, one of the big things is that the tougher cases are going to laparoscopic that have surgery, 
the very, the very easy cases are going to percutaneous. So we kind of have to find a group of patients and propensity score match them that are sort of eligible for both. Yeah, there are a lot of good methods, things uh, that had to be thought up, thought through that um, I think you and Rob did a great job of, of doing ahead of time. There's another comment. Um, I assume it's standard of care to give laxative before and after all PD catheter placements in this study. That's a good question. Um, some people feel strongly about that, but the general surgeons, at least our general surgeon, does not. So um, when I asked that to our general surgeon, laparoscopic surgeons, he said there's they do not aggressively do bowel preps for laparoscopic surgery because um, I think, I don't know this for sure, but I thought there was some kind of move away from that in terms of general surgery and laparoscopic. Maybe I'm sure people on the call know more than I do. But definitely for the percutaneous, but not necessarily for the laparoscopic. I don't know what your all experience is. I don't believe our surgeons ask them to take laxatives um, beforehand. Okay, uh, I'm going to uh, comment here that uh, this it relates also to the location of the exit site. Uh, I believe that those responsibilities are of the nephrologist, not the surgeon. Uh, we don't give the surgeons uh, here a choice. Uh, we prescribe laxatives three nights before and two nights before the surgery, not the night before, so they don't have loose stool going into surgery. And we uh, locate the uh, at least the level of the exit site. As far as left versus right, uh, if it's a laparoscopic placement, the surgeons would, would not want to be uh, committed to one side or the other. But the height of the, uh, of the uh, exit site relative to the umbilicus is determined by uh, the uh, home dialysis nurse. Yeah, we used to have our nurse practitioner uh, mark our exit sites. Um, I think since then, uh, for whatever reason, the surgical team um, had requested that they mark their own sites. Um, I personally haven't had issues recently with any of the exit sites. I'm not sure if any of the other nephrologists at my center have. And um, it looks like at Kaiser Northern California, they prescribed their laxative uh, two days before the PD catheter replacement. I guess, uh, Dr. Oliver, I had a question. What was your biggest surprise when you looked at the, I guess specifically with the results of this manuscript? Um, a few surprises. One of the things we've really detected is this concept of PD never started. So, you know, most PD studies start at the start of PD. Um, and so one of the unique things about this registry is we were able to track people from the date of insertion. And there's a fairly high rate of PD never started. Um, we have a new paper coming out now and the rate was 9%. So 9% of people failed PD before PD was even started. And so this is, means that they failed before training or during training, to be clear, PD is starts in this registry when they go home or they or they receive any type of full care PD. So say someone starts in the hospital before training, that's considered the start of PD, but normally people, they train and then they go home on PD. And of course, these problems get detected sometimes during training or during flushes. And so that's an underestimated loss from PD. And then, in, and then another sort of 20% failed after that within the first year. So you're talking to 29% failure rate within the first year. Um, so I thought that was a that was probably an underappreciated um, phenomenon. And if you and, and Manuel did a nice job of presenting that, half of the complications were detected before PD started. And then another half were after PD started. Now um, you're 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 more likely to detect complications once you start PD in some ways, because you're starting to use the catheter and, you know, the patient's dependent on it. But I, I just wanted to kind of make that point that um, we're, we're really, really detecting a lot of early on complications. Yeah, that's something that really surprised me too. And then um, at least, I think there are a lot of places in the United States um, where the 
pre-dialysis to the dialysis transition, it's not all necessarily in one system. So for example, for us, we have our CKD care in our county clinics, and that's where all of our surgeons do our placements. But once they get started on dialysis, it's actually done at DeVita, uh, which is, we don't have our um, dialysis unit as part of our uh, county system um, in terms of the EMR. So the nephrologist might be the same, but it's not necessarily the same nurses, for example, that are taking care of the patients all across. So it has been kind of tricky because then you do have this, there's a little bit of a gap in the system where um, like the nephrologist and the patients are kind of the bridge between pre and post. Um, but it's the same thing that you said, like, you know, this whole issue of we want to catch issues before PD has started. But then there's like this issue of, well, when is the PD patient considered a dialysis patient? Um, when they start the training or do you register them as soon as the, the catheter is placed and then um, we're doing the flushing and then that's when they're considered a PD patient. But um, it's similar for when you're tracking any sort of infection, uh, any sort of uh, catheter complication, including infections, where I think a lot of times the thought was, okay, well, why would you get an infection before you started on PD? But you do have to start as soon as that PD catheter is placed, as soon as it's placed and you have the possibility of getting infection. But again, that issue of in the United States, at least, um, it's not all one continuous person following the patient um, from insertion of the catheter all the way uh, to immediately uh, starting starting dialysis. Um, there's also a couple other comments that the outpatient, uh, there's another unit where they said the outpatient dialysis nurse team recommends Docuset and Senna at the top at the time of the pre-op visit. Um, and it's not put on the surgical team, mm -hmm. and that the outpatient nursing team is actually not so great with the exocyte planning, and that the surgeon ends up uh, redoing the marking um, at that location. I believe that's um, Irvine. Um, and there's another question. Is there a correlation with early complication and PD clinic sizes? Um, the assumption is that larger clinics would probably have less complications. Um, there should be. We haven't done the analysis, but we do. We do. We do adjust for center effect uh, when we do our models. So that's something that's usually been shown. Um, if I could just make another comment about a couple of other things that we've learned, um, one of them is like there's huge variation in how people do this, and it's very kind of localized. So, for example, in Calgary, which is a huge program, put in hundreds and hundreds of catheters, they use a single cuff PD catheter, and and like they, I'm not even sure they're aware. Do you know what I mean? Like it's it, that that's a bit of an anomaly. Every other program uses a double cuff catheter. Um, one large program, Wake Forest, they insert all of their catheters laparoscopically through the midline. So they're, they're not going through the rectus muscle. They're not burying the catheter in the rectus muscle. They're doing a midline insertion with a cuff and a prepared to kneel space, which is also a very unusual practice. I'm not saying it's wrong, it's just like you see these kind of local pockets and all the surgeons tend to do the same technique within the one center. Like it's like the one surgeon taught all the other surgeons how to do it. So I, it is important for your practice to know kind of what you are, what you are doing locally, um, you know, because you may have a bit of an anomaly that's just, that's just carried over sort of year over year and you're not really sort of aware of it. There's another comment that, um, you know, the fragmentation of care in the U.S., it's really an issue since a lot of the PD surgeons, they may or may not get the feedback that they need regarding complications. And, um, and you know, that's one way that they could learn from them if they had um, better feedback. I would say um, one thing that I thought was interesting that I learned, I think it was at the annual dialysis uh, conference. Um, I don't remember now which speaker it was, was talking about how they grew their home program. Um, they actually took the time to invite all of the local surgeons out to dinner. <laughs> and so they they uh, took them out to dinner so they can socialize and then talk to them about why they're so excited about PD as a way of trying to um, get them more involved and more uh, excited about doing PD catheter insertions. Because um, I think it's not even just um, that they think of it as a basic procedure. It's also uh, not something that they get reimbursed very well for. So I think it's not something that they're even interested in doing, um, not because it's just basic, but they don't get paid well for it either. And they actually flew Todd Penner down for that dinner from UHN at Toronto, who's a very, very keen on this procedure. He's kind of like the Canadian version of John Crabtree. So I think, it, I think it wasn't that they weren't interested in the procedure. It's just that they had not heard it from a, a peer that told them like, this is all the little nuances and stuff to do. The other point I would make is that you, if you look in the baseline table, the EGFR at placement was 8.8 .8 mils per minute. 
So those are in pre-dialysis patients only, because obviously, but given that the level of complications is what it is, I do wonder about earlier, like higher EGFR starts because of like, we need time to work, sometimes work things out with patients and struggle through some of these complications. And if you're starting at an eight, it doesn't take much for things to go wrong and the person go on to hemo. In Canada, I don't know if you have these kind of criteria, but we're benchmarked on how many people we start over 9.5 mils per minute. And if our percentage goes too high, they 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 don't ding us financially, but we're, we're like, you know, blamed or shamed or whatever. And so there's this kind of pressure not to start people too early. I mean, interested in Tom's or anyone else's opinion on that. So um, uh, first of all, Matt, I agree with you, and it, it is controversial. You one would make the same argument with an AV fistula, is that uh, you don't know for sure that that AV fistula is going to fly, and maybe you should be doing some low intensity dialysis uh, earlier. Uh, but but as you pointed out, uh, Matt, there's the, the expense of that is the concern. Yeah, I don't. Uh, we're not benchmarked here for what GFR we start our patients at. Um, but that's really interesting. I didn't I didn't know that that was a quality metric that you uh, that Canada had. I think it's belated, but it's the ideal study, right? Um, the one that was the randomized. Yeah, the ideal study. It was based sort of on that, but. I don't want to give CMS any ideas for things to benchmark you about uh, more on, but uh, that's what we do up here. I have to say I was um, a little reassured because one of our most um, uh, experienced uh, PD surgeons, uh, PD catheter insertion surgeons, he actually changed institutions. And I don't, I actually have to look back at our records to know if it's true or not, or if it's just my own internal bias. I thought that there were a lot more complications than before. Um, and I thought, oh, how weird that we're starting to have so many of these pop up before PD even started. <laughs> um, but then again, I it was great to review this paper because I was like, oh, that's right. Like if you look at all commerce, um, all PD surgeons, both those who have a lot of experience and just, you know, regular people who are just doing them to, to get the procedures done. I was like, okay, it looks like our surgeons here aren't, um, aren't behind the curve necessarily. <laughs> and I guess that's another thing to point out is I think you made a good point, um, Matt, um, where it makes a huge difference, I think, when you hear from your peers for the surgeons to hear from another surgeon. I mean, obviously the surgeons don't want to be hearing from me what I think they're doing correctly or not doing because I don't do any of these my, uh, do any of these procedures myself. Any other uh, comments? Congratulations on all this data collection. It's a really large effort. We have two more papers under review right now. Uh, one is looking at abdominal, the role of abdominal surgery prior to insertion. And the other one is specifically looking at what adhesions observed at the time of laparoscopic placement, how they impact outcomes. So hopefully some more stuff coming out soon. Yeah, and I would also say um, Dr. Oliver, he actually <laughs> went through individually, like every data entry push that we did, he actually went through um, himself personally um, to make sure that the data were as, as good as it could be. So it's a, it's a lot of a lot of work, definitely a labor of love. And any trainees on the call, uh, we will be announcing a ISPD research scholarship uh, coming soon for people who to work on uh, the data to write a paper and uh, we're gonna be uh, offering a stipend. So that's just keep an eye out for that coming up. So thanks again, everyone for joining. Um, I will push out an email to let you know the rest of the dates. The next one is going to be November 13th. If um, any of the programs on this call will be interested in presenting for November, please just shoot me an email and let me know. Um, and again, just let me know if you want to add or, or uh, delete anybody from those distribution lists. Um, I think um, there are some people who have another meeting to go to uh, straight away at 1.30 in person, so they have to walk there. So feel free to drop off the call. Um, and again, thank you so much to um, Dr. Uh, uh, Rivera for uh, presenting. And also thank you so much for uh, Dr. Oliver for taking the time to be here. You can tell like so many of these questions would not have been able to be answered by anybody except for, except for you. So thanks again, and then I look forward to seeing you guys in a couple of weeks, a couple of months, excuse me.
Thank you.